Thank you, Erin. Hello, everybody. My name is Carol Bornstein. I'm on the board of the Horticulture Society, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker to you this evening, Scott Logan. Um, Scott has um, collaborated with Susan Gottlieb and I'm going to have to consult the book here, Jacob Warren Lang uh, as the writer on this incredibly beautiful and informative book, which he will be talking about very shortly, about the Gottlieb Native Garden. Um, several of uh, the viewers of this program this evening, I'm sure, have visited that garden. It's been featured for many years. Um, on the Theodore Payne Foundation tour, as well as other organizations that uh, um, the Gottliebs have graciously opened their gates to. And Scott um, has been the naturalist um, who has been documenting all of the wildlife that has been visiting and taking up residence in that garden over the past several years. He has taken all of, I think all of the photographs that are in this book, practically all of them. He's a really exceptional photographer. Um, he also coordinates um, the various research um, uh, projects that take place in the, in the Gottlieb Garden. And um, he monitors the overall health of, of the garden and its biodiversity. Uh, and on top of that, um, he is a partner in the um, Wild Wings um, uh, retail um, uh, shop here in, I think it's in Burbank or Sh Sherman Oaks, maybe. Anyway, um, he's um, going to speak with us tonight about the book and the wildlife that has um, been visiting this garden uh, for the last several years. So please welcome Scott. All right, thank you very much for that, Carol. Um, you know, I'm always so happy to give this presentation to gardening groups like this because I think it's so important that we not only enjoy the beauty that's in our gardens, but we connect to the fauna that lives with them as well. I'm not a trained biologist, I'm simply a naturalist and a wildlife observer. And I say this because I want you all to know that the animals portrayed in this presentation are not beyond the reach of anyone who's willing to seek them out. So let's get into this here. All right. Um, as we begin, I wanna take this opportunity to thank Susan and Dan Gottlieb for allowing me to spend so much time in their garden and for supporting this and so many other wildlife endeavors. And I also wanna thank you, Carol, um, for not only bringing your expertise to Susan's garden, but for your contribution of infinite knowledge to the movement of gardening with California native plants. All right, so let's get into the presentation. So I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and I've always marveled at how much wildlife can be found in the city that contains over 4 million human inhabitants. But I was even more surprised to find out how diverse wildlife could be in just one urban yard. It's a yard landscaped with California native plants. For the past six years as a gardens naturalist, I've been documenting the wildlife that utilizes this space, as well as coordinating and participating in university-led scientific study. The Gottlieb Native Garden continues to prove without a doubt that we can begin to repair the negative effects caused by decades of urban development and support native wildlife by simply planting native landscapes. So you won't recognize me in this photo, but this is how I spend much of my time in the garden, literally lying in the bushes with a camera, or in this case, lying in the buckwheat. My subject in this shot was this large grass spider with a European honeybee that it had just captured. Up to this point, I've been able to identify nearly 500 species of animals on this property. This would include tiny insects, up to some of Los Angeles's largest mammals. Over 100 species on that list of birds. As of last week, it was 107 species but a Townsend Solitaire was discovered this week, so now we're at 108. Now, a few of these species are one day wonders, like these two Caspian terns that happen to fly over the garden. And some species appear in the garden only infrequently, like pine siskins. And for any of you out there who have niger feeders, you may have seen siskins on them a couple of months ago. 
Occasionally, these birds can be really unique, like this male leucistic alan's hummingbird. His coloration is very different than normal male alan's. If you compare it to the male that just landed on the edge of the bath, you'll notice that wherever the brown tones normally appear, those areas are white on the leucistic bird. It's quite stunning and it's been in the yard for about three years. Some birds on our list normally reside east of the Rockies, like white-throated sparrows. This white-throated sparrow spent the winter in the garden a couple of years ago. But probably the most lost long distant migrant that we've documented in the garden is this chestnut sided warbler, a species normally found on the northern east coast of the United States. But the majority of the birds that we find in the garden are residents like this house wren. Now another really impressive list is the 25 species of mammals utilizing this one urban yard. Our latest mammal species recorded was a western mastiff bat. This brings the total to nine confirmed bat species hunting insects in the garden's airspace. The number of species found in the garden is always growing. And last month, I got recordings of what I believe to be a pocketed free tail bat. This species is normally found in Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and only the extreme southern tip of California. So if it's vetted, this will be a very important documentation. And by the way, I captured this moment with a thermal imaging camera. Now the garden's ability to attract and to provide for such a wide variety of animal species has caught the attention of researchers, educators, and a broad range of environmental groups, including the Natural History Museum and National Geographic Magazine. And for me being a photographer, this was a highlight as I got to spend three days with a National Geographic Society fellow. This is Charlie Hamilton James. The BBC has filmed in the garden as has the National Geographic Channel. And for those of you who watch the Net Geo Channel, almost all the hummingbird clips that they show in their programs were filmed in Susan's yard. Some of the universities carrying out studies in the garden would include Loyola Marymount University, UCLA, Cal Poly, Occidental College and the University of California, Davis. Out of all the universities, UC Davis has the longest running research program in the garden. Dr. Lisa tells Hummingbird Health and Conservation Program has used the garden for study since 2014 and I've been personally collaborating with them since 2015. So essentially hummingbirds are captured and processed. All their vitals are taken, including blood and feather samples for future DNA analysis. Even the hummingbird's weight is taken. And if you ever wanted to know how a hummingbird gets weighed, well, there it is. The last part of the process is to insert a tiny pit tag under the hummingbird's skin. A small incision is made to insert the tag and then the bird is sutured up. Lastly, a numbered band is put on the bird's right leg and this becomes a future visual indicator that the bird is participating in the UC Davis study. After all this, the bird is ready to be released back into the garden. Six antennas strategically placed in the yard are tracking all these hummingbirds. The gray ring in this image is one of those antennas. Over the past six years, the program has banded or tagged over 1,000 hummingbirds in this one garden. As the antennas collect data, this is what we're looking at. Um, it's collecting an amazing amount of data. Uh, one interesting thing I can throw at you is that the oldest bird known in the study is now five years old. It's a female Allen's hummingbird. This groundbreaking work that UC Davis is doing on the health and social relationships of urban hummingbirds has now been published in many peer review journals. So for my species documentation project, much of the identification involves photography. And two years into this assignment, we realized a compelling wildlife story was being captured with these images and the seed for the next Gutley Native Garden book was planted. 
And that idea became a reality last summer with the release of the Gottlieb Native Garden and Intimate Wildlife Journey. So the majority of the photos from this point forward are gonna be all from this just published book. Now I thought before we get into the photos themselves, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the techniques I use to get them. I like to use flash in my photography because I personally like the look and feel of mixing different light sources when creating an image. Um, on this afternoon, I was capturing female leaf cutter bees provisioning their nests with pollen for their young. And if you look closely at the entrances to their tubes, you'll notice the different colors. Those hues represent the colors of flowers or leaves they used for capping their individual brood chambers. I spend a lot of time exploring at night. In this image, one of my trail cameras captured me as I checked camera settings while shooting nocturnal animals. Here's the bird I was shooting that night, a common poor will hunting from a cement swale. And the interesting fact about common poor wills is that they're the only bird species in the world known to truly hibernate. I also have a few passive DSLR camera traps that I continually move around the garden. It takes a great deal of time to set them up and to keep them operating. And one of the problems is, is, is that wildlife loves to chew on the cables. But in the end, all the effort pays off with really intimate shots like this one. These two fawn siblings are no more than a day or two old. Camera traps have the ability to really capture candid moments. Ooh, sorry, that's me getting caught checking on camera after dark. But out of all the photography featured in this project, the most technically complicated and time consuming are the focus stacked images made with live animals. This would be a typical setup, a Nikon D850 controlled by an iPad with multiple flashes. Sometimes I shoot indoors so I can control the environment. Focus stacking is basically taking multiple photos of one subject at different focal points and then stitching them all together to form an ultra sharp image. It's an amazing process that has the ability to produce high detailed images of very small subjects. Clearly that comes through with those aphids. With focus stacking, you're in complete control of the sharpness and depth of field, enabling you to do things that just aren't possible with normal camera settings. So this image happens to be of a Carolina Sphinx moth in front of the Gottlieb's entryway to their home. So I think it's a great place to start our photographic journey. Now, as we're looking at these images, I'm gonna ask you to please keep one thing in mind, that every single animal in this presentation is from one single yard, a yard right smack in the middle of Los Angeles. So some of these animals are reclusive and difficult to find like this ring neck snake. Others are so shy, we have to be really lucky to ever see them. But the majority of these animals like this hermit thrush can be found all over Los Angeles. All they need is the proper habitat and that's where native gardening comes in. Now I do wanna point out one thing about this garden, the east side adjoins chaparral habitat allowing a natural entryway for species of animals that need an expanse of native habitat like California quail and California thrasher. But the majority of the animals we get in the garden like the cedar waxwing could end up in virtually any of our yards. Now, many people think of European honeybees when they think of what they want their garden to support. But as the name implies, these bees are not native. They commandeer habitat like this screech owl box and outcompete our native bees for pollen. When a honeybee swarm moves into the Gottlieb native garden, it's humanely relocated like this hive that took over a barn owl box. When it comes to bees, I believe we should be focusing on the benefits of native bees like this legated furrow bee or this pollen covered slevin cellophane bee, a personal favorite of mine. In Los Angeles County alone, we have over 500 species of native bees. These bees evolved with their native flora and have become niche pollinators. This diversity ultimately contributes to a healthy ecosystem. The Gottlieb Native Garden has approximately 25 species of regular occurring bees. This digger bee is one of them. 
Digger bees can be really entertaining to watch as they zigzag from flower to flower and plant to plant. And some of these bees I find extremely beautiful, like female metallic green sweat bees. In the correct light, many species of sweat bees shimmer in metallic hues of greens, blues, and golds. And there are many plant families that I consider excellent for insect pollinators and buckwheat, which is pictured here, is definitely one of them. Bees aren't the only pollinators working hard in the garden. Many fly species are good pollinators too. And some of these are not just good pollinators, but they benefit a garden in many different ways. Take this four spotted aphid fly, for instance. Their young are carnivorous. Females lay their eggs near aphid infestations. And once they hatch, the larvae eat large amounts of the tiny pests. After flies, other beneficial pollinators would be butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, and of course, hummingbirds. Although not the best pollinators in our gardens, hummingbirds don't stop pollinating when it rains. Another group of insects that we all enjoy having in our gardens are butterflies. And I'm sure many of you already know, monarch butterflies can be attracted to yard by planting milkweed for the females to lay eggs on, as it is a host plant for their larvae. But when planting milkweed, it's very important to plant only native varieties. For us here in Los Angeles, one of them is A. fascicularis, or narrow leaf milkweed. Monarchs have a much better chance for a healthy reproduction cycle when using native milkweeds. And just as monarchs can be attracted by milkweed, other species of butterflies can be attracted by planting host plants for their larvae. Quail bush is one of the plants, is, is a plant host for Western Pygmy Blues, and it's, that happens to be one of my favorite butterflies found in the garden. It measures in at a mere three eighths of an inch. So they're the smallest butterfly found in North America and one of the smallest in the world, right here in Los Angeles. Butterflies and moths are not just beautiful, but they're an important part of the food chain. They lay an enormous amount of eggs, which turn into caterpillars some of which can be huge, like this white line sphinx moth larva consuming a primrose blood. Now, as Laura mentioned about the pipe vines, as far as we're concerned, if something's not eating the plants in your garden, then your garden's not part of the ecosystem. So we're happy to have this larva eating the plants. But you really don't have to worry because most butterfly and moth larva are very small. Now, whatever the size, insect larvae are an important food source to many animals in the garden, especially birds during breeding season. Insects are critical to the success of songbird broods, like these Buick wrens and bush tits. And by the way, if you've ever found a messy looking hanging nest that was constructed out of soft material and decorated with bits of leaves and sticks and flowers, that's a bush tit nest. And most native plants produce food that our native animals are familiar with, like this toyon bush. When it comes to plants having the ability to support native wildlife, I consider toyon a keystone species. Not only do birds like this Western bluebird eat the berries, but the toyon's flowers are great for native pollinators. Clearly this white banded crab spider is aware of this as it lies in wait for its next meal. Toyon is a perfect example of how wildlife prefers native over non-natives. Toyon fruit will be stripped from its branches by wildlife before ever touching the similar looking non-native pyracantha berries, even if those plants are found right next to each other. And this is true for seeding plants as well. Lesser goldfinches will eat native sage seeds before other non-native seeds. And historically, and as hummingbirds were the only year round species of hummingbird found in Los Angeles. They're connected with the rhythm of our native flowering plants. And just as it was mentioned before, manzanita blooms are on their nectar menu at the moment. While we're on the subject of food sources, the garden has some bird feeders intended to augment the nourishment being provided by the native plants. Nectar feeders are the most abundant with dozens of hummingbirds feeding at them at any given time. I think any of you who've been in the garden, it's something that you can't forget. 
This photo was taken in July and it shows three species of hummingbirds that are expected in the garden during the time period it was taken. That's Anna's, Allen's, and black chin hummingbirds. And it was in July that I believe that photo was taken. Every March, like clockwork, Orioles arrive and designated feeders especially made for them will be filled and ready. A few seed feeders are available for granivorous birds like California scrub jay. And mealworms are popular too, especially during breeding season. This male spotted toey is about to bring back a load of these insects to his nest. Now, do you happen to notice something in the right upper portion of this image? That's Sparky. It's one of Susan's cats in the cat run. These catatrails provide an ingenious way for cats to roam the garden. Wildlife is safe from the cats and the cats are protected from the wildlife. But I can't claim that the upper pond, the, um, I can't claim that the fish in the upper pond are safe from the wildlife because when herons come in for a meal, they're not chased off and they're allowed to hunt without being harassed. When wildlife takes something from the yard, we simply consider it nature's tax. Along with food, wildlife needs a clean source of water. Here, a yellow rump warbler drinks early morning dew that it collected on fairy duster leaves. Water features are an excellent addition to any landscape and the Gottlieb Native Garden has five of them. Not only do animals like these band-tailed pigeons drink from them, but animals bathe in them as well. The more diverse your water sources are, the more diverse the wildlife will be that uses them. And take hummingbirds, for instance. They love to take their baths as foraging for nectar is obviously a sticky business, but they normally will only bathe in very shallow, constantly moving water. No chemicals are ever used in any of the garden's water features and three of them support thriving ecosystems. Now over time, these water features as well as one in your yard will become an important stop for migrating birds. Birds have an excellent memory for resources along their migratory paths. And every year, hundreds of migratory birds visit the garden. During late April, it's not uncommon to see groups of Western tanagers jockeying for position in the lower water feature. Even a stormy afternoon didn't stop these cedar waxwings from using this water source, which is basically just a depression in a rock. Now, so many images have stories attached to them and I'm gonna stop at this one for a moment and tell you a story. This photo was taken by one of my DSLR camera traps. Here's what the camera setup looked like. The bath is in the lower middle, excuse me, the bath is in the lower middle right part of the frame and the camera is in the middle left. I happened to be in the garden checking on my equipment when a hailstorm began. So I retreated into the Gottlieb's home to wait it out. About a half an hour later, I returned to find an amazing rainbow. It was really magnificent. The arch framed the garden for nearly five minutes. Even as I sat and admired it, I noticed that hummingbirds would glow brilliant orange as they threw flew through the bands of color. It wasn't until the rainbow fully dissipated that I had the ability to check my camera and I found this image. Just as the storm had ended, the afternoon sun broke through the clouds and a flock of cedar waxwings flew down to, take, to drink and to take a bath. The timing was remarkable and luckily my equipment functioned properly to capture the moment. And thankfully, everything performed properly for this moment as well. This is one of my favorite images captured during this entire project. And as you can see, it's more than birds that take advantage of water features. Another important component of a healthy ecosystem are predators, and they come in many shapes and sizes. We're familiar with spiders, like the graceful green lynx spider, and praying mantises, like this native bordered mantis. Now, some of you may have purchased mantis egg cases from nurseries in the past, but I encourage you not to do that. These are always non-native mantises, and they're usually from Asia, and they're always much bigger than our native species. Ultimately, they wreak more havoc in our gardens than any organic pest control that they might have provided. 
one of the native insects that you can introduce into your garden for organic pest control are green lacewings. During spring, many nurseries sell their eggs. And once they hatch, these larvae will consume large amounts of plant damaging pests. Lacewing larvae are just one of the many small animals that make a living fiercely protecting our yards. Reptiles are also a very important part of keeping an ecosystem in balance. Fence lizards should be recognize, recognizable by most of you. And you may have noticed that these lizards spend a good deal of time in bushes and even up in trees. Being in the suborder iguana explains this behavior. Small snakes like this Western black-headed snake like to eat small terrestrial things like millipedes and centipedes. And to give you an idea of how small that snake is, those are scrub oak leaves on the ground. Without close inspection, it could easily be mistaken for a large worm. Now snakes come in plus sizes too, and our largest, the San Diego gopher snake, is an excellent rodent hunter. These snakes are confused with rattlesnakes all the time because they'll mimic rattling with a combination of vibrating their tail and hissing. And unfortunately, if it's a human that makes this misidentification, it's usually tragic for the snake. After good long rainy periods, which we have not had yet, black-bellied salamanders appear. They spend the majority of their times underground, but will venture above ground to feed and breathe when the environment is wet enough to keep their skin moist. And many songbirds are excellent hunters too, like this Western kingbird. But even excellent hunters need to watch out for predators. And no small bird in the garden is safe from Cooper's hawks. I know many of you are not happy about having these predators in your yard, but they are a very important part of keeping an ecosystem balanced. Raptors range significantly in scope and size. This is a sharp shinned hawk or sharpie, and it's about the size of a robin. This is the only bird in our area that I know of that can capture a hummingbird in flight. On the other end of the raptor spectrum in Southern California, the apex predator on wings is the great horned owl. They hunt a wide range of prey and have the ability to carry a rabbit. And when you pack a set of talons like these, everybody gets out of your way. And when California ground squirrel populations grow large, we see a lot more of our favorite bobcat. He happens to be tagged and collared and is known to the Park Service as B346. You can see his ear tag there in that picture. We call him Hank. Now I'm gonna back this shot up to show you something interesting. Earlier in the day before this photo was taken, the camera got photos of two other mammals. That's Leo the cat taking Susan for a walk in the garden. Now what's telling about this image is that urban well animals are so used to humans and domestic animals that they don't seem to care about sharing the same space with us. Breeding season in the garden is always exciting and a lively time. Animals are defining and defending territory, collecting nesting material, and building homes to raise their children in. And after all the preparation, the romance begins. And then the children appear and sometimes loads of them. However you feel about California ground squirrels, their babies are really cute. Now for me, the most magical time to tune into the garden is the period between day and night. It's that space where diurnal animals are just finishing their shift and nocturnal animals are beginning theirs. And then once it's dark, I highly recommend exploring your garden to see what you can find. Yep, there'll be the usual suspects like orb spiders and moths, all of which I find extremely beautiful. I mean, the wings of moths are literally nature's canvas for elaborate tapestries. To me, the pattern on this elder moth could be used on an elegant dress. But if you just simply take the time to be quiet and observe, you're sure to be amazed at what appears. Take beetles, for instance. 
Some species are active during the day, like this green fruit beetle, but many more are active at night. They come in amazing designs and colors and their life cycles are fascinating. The beetle on the upper left is a firefly. Yes, we have fireflies in Los Angeles, but it's the flightless fleet females that glow and not the flighted males. But out of all the beetles I encounter in the garden, black bearing beetles are by far the most interesting and fantastic. They are always covered in helpful symbiotic mites and I could do a presentation on just their life cycle alone. And let's give a shout out to striped skunks for a moment. When you notice that holes were dug in your garden the night before, you really should be saying thank you. Skunks have an excellent sense of smell and their front claws are built for digging. They snuffle around your garden searching for root damaging grubs and dig them up to eat, preventing, damaging, preventing these damaging insects to your garden's plants and trees. This guy was coming from the next door neighbors and apparently their sprinklers were on and it seems that he got his face all muddy while he was collecting dinner. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that don't like scorpions to a skunk, they're considered a delicacy. And here's a tip for those of you that do like scorpions. The easiest way to find them at night is by searching with an ultraviolet light. Their exoskeletons glow a bluish color by absorbing the longer wavelengths in the UV spectrum, then re-emitting them in different wavelengths that are visible to us in the dark. Northern raccoons are just one of the many different characters utilizing our gardens at night. And sometimes when these animals' paths cross, there's drama. I know this appears bad for the skunk, but there's no need to worry. In the end, it was the coyote that got the raw end of this encounter. I know because this is only one frame in a series of photographs. And you have to just love the look on that skunk's face. And he's about to leave a lasting impression on that coyote. It's always exciting when you run across a really unique animal like this unusually patterned striped skunk. Like the leucistic hummingbird I showed you, it makes him really easy to identify. And I know from trail cameras that he visits the yard frequently and has been around for over three years now. There are two great horned owls that have been around even longer. As I said before, I began working in the garden over six years ago, and these two owls have been a bonded pair that entire time. I know it's the same birds because their routine has stayed exactly the same year after year. The larger female owl is on the left, the male is on the right. In fact, these lovebirds are very active in the garden right now. Great horned owls breeding season begins in November and, will and many will have eggs in their nest by January. They don't actually build their nest. They commandeer someone else's like a red-tailed hawk or common raven's nest. I'm sure that many of you are hearing their territorial hoots right now. They're basically telling other great horned owls that this real estate is already taken. Another animal romance is between our bobcat Hank and a young female who showed up about this time last year. I often wonder if she likes his park service bling. In this clip, she's marking a stump in the garden. Her scent will let Hank know that she's in heat and will accept his loving advances. But whether you're prowling around on your own or wandering with others, you must always stay alert and on guard as there are constant dangers threatening all wildlife, even animals as large as a deer. Yes, a mountain lion has even visited the garden. P-22 isn't the only lion roaming the Santa Monica Mountains east of the 405 freeway. Huel, as we have affectionately, affectionately named him, is an uncolored male with unknown origins. Over the past four years, our cameras have captured him a few times, the first being back on October of 2016. What I find incredible about this cat is that he manages to stay virtually undetected to residents of the neighborhoods in which he roams. And that's a testament to how these big cats want nothing to do with human contact. Awe-inspiring encounters with mountain lions aside, 
Our gardens are alive with special moments every day. I encourage you to take the time to sit quietly and observe. Special moments are sure to reveal themselves. Like an adult Cooper's hawk drying its feathers after a morning shower. You might notice a flock of cedar wax wings moving north in the spring. You'll know that fall is upon us with the arrival of white crowned sparrows as they fill the air with their delightful melodies. With patience, you might witness a mi minor dispute over water rights at a favorite bath. Basically, the more you turn into tune into the rhythms of your garden, the more wildlife will appear. And that's how connection happens. That's the Zen of it. And who knows, one day you might be sitting quietly and realize that somebody is watching you. Thank you so much for letting me share some of LA's urban wildlife with you. I really hope it inspires you to look in some bushes and turn over some rocks. Wildlife can really be so rich in a native garden. And if any of you are interested, I occasionally post on the Gottlieb Native Gardens website, and that's thegottliebnativegarden.com. And for more about the garden's fauna and its history, you can find that in Susan Gottlieb's wonderful book, The Gottlieb Native Garden, A California Love Story. And with that, I will turn it back to Erin. I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if you can hear me. Ah, there you are. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, that was something going on in my computer. Even though we, we test for this, still we have a few hiccups every now and then. Um, well, what I had said before I realized that I was on mute is that with every slide, I wanted to take this mental picture because your photography is just absolutely stunning. But then I remembered I can just buy the book. And that is actually our first question. How can you buy your book? Uh, you can purchase the book from either my website, which is uh, uh, wildwingsla.com or from the Gottlieb Native Gardens website, which is thegottliebnativegarden.com. Perfect. And we're going to be answering questions right now for Scott. So if you guys have any questions for him, please feel free to add them to the Q&A feature right below your screen. So this question is from Laura B. Does Scott know how much effort is needed to keep the Gottlieb's water features going? water is so important to wildlife? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's not a lot of effort because they don't put any chemicals in them and they sort of just let what's going to happen happen with them. I think they probably do a good cleaning, um, which would be draining most of the water and taking out leaves and things um, probably once a year, um, maybe twice a year. But when you clean a water feature too much, then you're really disrupting the ecosystem that begins to get going in it. And that's really important because it produces a lot of food for animals besides being a place for them to get water and, and to bathe in. Well, this next question is from Jill V. And I feel like anyone who has not yet been to the Gottlieb Native Garden are curious, how large is the garden? Believe it or not, it's just an acre. So. 
I even look at the species list. I think back at what I found there, and it's kind of hard to believe, but it, it is only an acre. I was definitely thinking something much bigger. I'm like, how yeah. can I, how could I have missed that? <laughs> <laughs> the next question comes from Mary S. Do parrots contribute to gardens and environment? Do parrots contribute? Well, that's actually a very big question here in Los Angeles because we have a lot of feral parrots. And I think there's something like 15 or 18 of those species that are actively breeding. Um, the thing to think about is, is there a negative effect to our plant life here in Los Angeles? I think the majority of those, all but two of those species that are actively breeding here are only taking advantage of non-native plants. So those would be plants probably from South America where most of those parrots are from. So I don't think they're really competing with our native wildlife. We do have a parrot species here called a Nandi parakeet. And that lives in the Santa Monica mountains and is able to survive on native plants and native food and is a cavity nester and takes over our native birds cavities. So that's pushing out our native birds who would normally be nesting in them. So they're probably a bit of a hindrance. I don't know that they're in the numbers to really cause any problem like say starlings or, or English sparrows are, um, but there's probably a little bit of a negative attached to them instead of a positive. All right, and our next question is from Lynn H. What is the best resource for identifying your insects? I have orange dragonflies in my garden every year. I would like to know if they are native. The larvae live in the residue in the source of my rill. Well, I would guess that they are native. I don't know of any non-native dragonflies that are around here. There, there might be, but I'm, I'm sure it's native. But the best resource now would be iNaturalist. Um, you make an iNaturalist account, take pictures of your uh, dragonflies, post them on the account, and people mine through all these photos and will attach a name to it. And slowly but surely, the more people that look at it, it becomes vetted by people who really know what they're talking about. Now, I personally don't use iNaturalist. I have other sources, um, but the sources I, I use are a bit more cumbersome just for the average backyard gardener, I think. And then our next question is from Catherine M. I live in Riverside County and I have a little more than four acres. That's mostly wild. I'd love to create an interplanted native and food forest. Do you have any experience with this? If I intensely plant perennial fruit trees, shrubs and vines alongside natives, will this hinder native wildlife? Um, will it hinder native wildlife? No. As for the plant species to, to plant, that's a Carol Bornstein question. That's not my question. Um, but as I said before, there's a couple of keystone species. I don't know if there's any oaks that exist on that property, but oak, you, when it comes to very large keystone species is oaks and sycamores and walnuts. Um, but for food sources, it's toyon for birds and mammals and uh, pollinators. And then uh, I, I find that buckwheat is a great starter too that services a lot of pollinators. But there's some great resources out there now. And, and again, maybe Carol could answer that question. Um, but if it's a wild space to begin with, I'm sure it has a, wild life, a lot of wildlife in it already. Actually, speaking of Carol, she did recommend for the insect identification question, insects of the LA Basin as another good resource. And I feel terrible for not saying that because although I don't use it anymore, I, it was my go-to book. I used it for years and it's a lovely book and it's by the, it's uh, published from the Natural History Museum. And um, as you're beginning to get into identifying insects in your yard, it's an excellent resource. So thanks for reminding that. Actually, speaking of oak trees, Laura B wants to know, does the Gottlieb Garden have any oak trees? Um, so that uh, short answer is yes. Um, we, back in the day when the developers developed this area, um, they tore out some oak habitat uh, that was there. And um, so a couple of oak trees had survived that tear out, but the majority of them were taken away. But I think this was probably back in the 50s. And, and just by volunteering, some of these oaks have grown back. 
On top of that, Susan has planted oaks on her property. Now, the oaks that she's planted on her property are beginning to become mature enough to actually start contributing to the ecosystem. I mean, they, they have acorns on them, so they have food. Um, but when an, a, set, a stand of oaks becomes mature, you get a whole ecosystem within just that stand of oaks. And that's what I'm hoping for. Um, one of the key species I'm waiting to arrive would be a Western screech owl. Um, we have screech owl boxes out for them. And when that happens, I'll know that her oak woodland habitat has come back to where it was before they developed that neighborhood. The next question is from Vivian S. Troubled with Sumatran cockroaches eating the roots of my succulents. Arrived a few years ago and don't want to use pesticides. Raccoons, possums, and skunks have recently found them if the digging is any indication, but they are still around. Do you have any recommendations there? Uh, I think, well, this is the way I look at it is, well, first of all, non-native animals can wreak such havoc and that's a problem. If our native animals can figure out a way to take advantage of that explosion, then normally they'll bring it under control. And that's what wildlife does. I mean, wildlife never gets rid of anything, never gets rid of a problem. The problem isn't completely taken away. What it does is it keeps something in balance. Uh, just like the ground squirrels uh, in Susan's yard, it's really amazing. I mean, those are native animals, right? But I know that when their populations grow, we're gonna see bobcats in the yard much more often than we normally do because the bobcats come and they realize, oh, there's a food source here and they take advantage of it. Do they get rid of every single ground squirrel? No, they don't. But I think that's exactly the same thing with skunks, especially digging up something like that you know, in your garden, is if they realize that there's this bounty of food because of these roaches, they're gonna stay around and cull out that bounty until it's not advantageous for them to stay there anymore. And that's just kind of how they keep things in balance. So no, I don't think they'll get rid of them completely, but they'll, they certainly have the ability to keep them under control. Well, Scott, would you explain those catwalks a bit more? <laughs> that's from Jill V. It's pretty ingenious. Basically, um, it's like a habit trail, you know, like a hamster habit trail, but it's for cats. And instead of being surrounded in plastic, it's surround, these walks are, are surrounded in screen and, and they run through a portion of the garden. They, they go this way and that, they go up to the roof of the house, they have uh, some sort of condominiums they, they can go to. And it's brilliant because it really, get, it, it really fulfills the need for a cat to be outside. But in a yard like Susan's, a cat being outside is dangerous for many reasons. One, that yard is so full of wildlife that these cats would be catching that wildlife. But there's wildlife there that can catch the cats. So essentially, everyone's protected from each other. Um, they enter and exit from, I think, four different spots in the house. So you can see a cat leave the house in one part of the, you know, or, or leave one part of the house, and then a half an hour later, he turns up somewhere else in the house. So it's kind of entertaining. But anyone could make it. It's just basically uh, a run of wood that's surrounded by screen and has an entry and exit into the house. We're actually going to go back to the question from Catherine about uh, internative, an internative and food forest, excuse me, interplanted native and food forest. So Carol has answered and she says, interplanting fruit trees with natives is fine. The pollinators that the natives attract will help to pollinate your fruit trees as well, boosting your harvest. Plus the natives will attract other beneficial insects that will keep pests under control. So good suggestion, Scott, for sending it over to Carol. And Carol, thank you for That's answering Perfect answer. <laughs> Our next question is from Lynn H. How do you encourage Orioles to the feeders? They are here for such a short time. I usually only see them for one day in my garden as they pass through in March. So that, that's the trick. The trick is, is to get them to find the feeder. Once Orioles find the feeder, find, a feed, find that food source, and you get them coming to that food source, you will have Orioles for as long as you want to have Orioles every season, every year. And the reason why is that when those Orioles who are using those Oriole feeders breed, they bring their kids to the Oriole feeder. And birds 
have some kind of tracking system in their head or GPS system in their head. I, I don't know exactly how to wrap my mind around it, but the Orioles that are born in your neighborhood or born by your house and are using your feeder are gonna go off in winter down in, in Mexico because uh, I'll assume that they're hooded Orioles. But when they return, those same birds are gonna return to your yard. Now, the problem is only one, me, one male and one female are gonna be able to hold down that territory if mom and dad survived and they made it back, then they're gonna kick those kids out of that territory. They're gonna to have to find their own territory. But what happens is, is you get two birds who will be coming to your Oriole feeder every single year. But again, how do you get it to come to your feeder? You make sure that your feeder's out by the second week of March. And you want it in a very open spot so that they easily see it as well as nearish to um, a really large bush or a small tree, because if you ever watched an Oriole come to a feeder, they're extremely skittish. They want somewhere where they can hide, bolt out of the feeder, go back uh, into a hiding area. So all I can say is, is that you just stick with it. And, and everyone who sticks with it, it may not happen the first season, it may not happen the second season, but eventually they get a hit and then they'll have Orioles for the, as long as they want to feed Orioles. And by the way, or the Oriole season in here, here in the Los Angeles area, or I should say Southern California, um, would be they arrive in March, the males leave by late August, and the females and the young leave by mid-September. Well, Carol also asks, don't some of the plants in the garden attract the Orioles as well? You know, I've never, I have to admit <clears throat> that I've never seen an Oriole eating any kind of native plant nectar. Um, I'm sure that there are some out there. What they love are they, I think they're called uh, mon monkey paws or whatever, um, or something like that. They're from Australia. Um, I see them on those, but I don't see them on natives. I, I don't know what, you know, let's back up a little bit. Prior to us, populating uh, the Los Angeles basin, there really weren't many hooded orioles here. You'd only find them in washes. They're a bird that needs to weave its nest in a palm tree. So wherever palms existed, you would find hooded orioles. That would have been more in the, the desert areas and, uh, and south. Once we began building out Los Angeles planting palms, um, then orioles sort of moved into our neighborhoods the nectar that they're getting was from non-native sources as well as uh, oriole feeders when people put out oriole feeders. Um, but in this particular area, I'll have to admit, I've never seen an oriole drinking nectar from a native plant. Carol has said that she has seen them on agave blossoms and grevilleas as well. Okay. And she said that they had an oriole nest in one of the palm trees at the Natural History Museum too. Yeah, so hooded Orioles have to have a palm leaf for their nest. Like, here's something to think about is, is that, and this is something you think about for your garden. If you wanna have wildlife in your garden, you need to have four important things for them. You need to have food, water, shelter, and a place to nest. Now, nesting or building their homes to raise their children is different for every species of animal and when we're talking about hooded Orioles, they have to have a palm leaf to weave their nest in because they literally weave it into it. If you ever bring down a palm leaf that has an Oriole nest in it, it'll absolutely blow your mind because they, they weave the basket into that leaf. Without a palm leaf, they have nowhere to nest. That means they're not going to stay. It's not, they don't think of it as, oh, well, I have food and I have water and I have shelter, but I need to reproduce. So when you're building out your garden, always think about that reproduction side of the equation. And then another note on Orioles from Eric B. Grape jelly is also an excellent source of food for Orioles. Bees too. Ours also use the red feeders by First Nature, same brand as your orange feeders. Uh, First Nature, I believe, makes a really good Oriole feeder. It's kind of a cheap plastic thing, but it has an oval, hole for, for the Orioles to, to stick their beaks into, and that prevents bees from getting into them. Now, uh, to the jelly question, absolutely. If you get Orioles eating jelly, um, you, you, you really set a hook in them. But the problem is, is that you can't just put out a jar of jelly or, or, or a, you know, a bowl of jelly 
um, before or you have Orioles coming because one, that jelly will dry out. Two, uh, when, he, when, when it was just mentioned that bees go to it, I personally um, am not an advocate of European honeybees and those are the bees that go to the jelly. So I'm not advocating feeding European honeybees with jelly. But if you have them coming to a nectar feeder and you put out jelly and they discover that jelly, it's an excellent thing to feed them. And as a side note, for some reason, most Orioles don't like jelly made with corn syrup. They only like jelly made with sugar. Um, so look for jellies with sugar. All right. We do have a couple more questions, but before we answer those, we are going to do our door prize. So we're going to share the wheel of names. Give me just one moment. All right. We're going to tap and see who this week's door prize winner is. And the prize is a copy of Scott's new book. So that is really exciting. I took my name out of it though. I thought that'd be cheating. Carol A, yay, are you still here? I think you are. Let me stop the share and confirm. Yes, Carol, all right. You will be hearing from us shortly. And if anyone has to go as well, please uh, feel free to. We're going to have this recording on our website and at our YouTube channel as well. It'll be posted in the next couple of days. Keep your ears open and your eyes open too on our website, our social media, where we'll post everything. And also I do wanna mention our next meeting, which is a very, very, very special meeting for us as it is the first it is our inaugural Ruth Bourne lecture series. And Ruth Bourne was a longtime Southern California Horticultural Society member. And you know, with her family, we've be, we have been able to create this new series, um, which will have our first one next month with Jennifer Jewell of Cultivating Place, How a Garden Culture of Care Strengthens Places and Their People. And again, this event is absolutely free for everyone, but you must register because registration is limited. And you can visit our website for more details and the registration, socalhort.org. And lastly, before we continue with the Q&A, um, if you've benefited from tonight's webinar or any of the content that we have posted online, please consider donating whatever you can to our organization. Uh, as you all probably know, our in-person events like our coffee in the garden series or any of our field trips as well, are you, is usually where we get most of our revenue from. So without having those right now during the pandemic, it has been difficult, um, but we have loved being on, on Zoom and being able to connect with so many people from all over as well. So it's been a really great time for us to connect with you guys. And again, whatever you feel you can donate, we are very grateful for. And thank you to all the donors that we have had previously Again, every dollar counts and it makes a huge difference for us. So Scott, let's continue with these last few questions. Uh, the next one is from Laura B. Have any of their neighbors, the Gottliebs, followed their lead and replanted their properties with natives? Unfortunately, the, the short answer is no. Um, she is in a pretty high rent district of Beverly Hills and um, people love their exotic gardens. Uh, what can you say? But there's a uh, there's sort of a wave of building going on right now, and Susan's really, really actively trying to get the builders to put in, if not all natives, at least some natives. And there just seems to be a bit of a resistance to it. I mean, I certainly feel a, a, a sort of a groundswell of things changing, um, but in that particular neighborhood, I haven't seen anybody change their gardens because of Susan's. Now, with that said, it's really interesting. Um, the neighbors stop and admire her garden all the time, but I don't see them changing theirs. The next one is from Catherine M. I have the hardest time finding native plants for sale and even harder finding seed. Do you have recommendations on this? I know you're in LA and I understand you may not know in my area. I'm in the Inland Empire, Riverside County specifically. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I know it's uh, the Theodore Payne Foundation, but uh, Carol probably would have a better answer than I would for that question. I believe Rancho Santa Ana might have a good selection and it's close as well to Riverside County. 
Um, we also have Tree of Life Nursery, which is in Orange County. And we have the California Native Plant Society Riverside chapter. Uh, they check their Facebook page as well and their website. They probably have links to other local nurseries that sell native plants. And well, let's end with this question here from Maria B. Please repeat the book title covering this presentation and the website as well. So the book is The Gottlieb Native Garden, a, um, An Intimate Wildlife Journey. And the website that you can buy it at is wildwingsla.com. So that's wildwingsla.com. And there's also a link on the gardens website, which is the Gottlieb Native Garden.com. Perfect. We'll also have that information posted on our on our past meetings page once we get this webinar archived. And uh, to answer a previous question that we had from Ash Ashley S, um, the Horticulture Society, we are advocates for you know organic gardening and organic gardening practices of course um, if you want to share anything with the horticulture society that you feel we should share with others especially in terms of conservation efforts to please feel free to uh, you can reach us on facebook on instagram or even our email at socalhort at gmail.com and we will always answer i love getting content also from people with different conservation efforts too. So please share so that we can share with our broader community as well. And on that note, Scott, do you have anything else you wanna add? Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for letting me present. You got it. Thank you for such a great presentation and everyone as well. Thank you for your all of your questions and for joining us tonight. We will share Scott's information as well if you guys have any further questions, okay? Have a good night, everyone. Scott, thank right. you. We're getting a ton of messages right now about just how great the presentation was. Great. So thank, thank you, you very much. Take care, everyone. Likewise. Have a good night, everyone.